to explain how OSPF works, let's break it down to different steps. Step 1 is to enable the local OSPF process and choose the router ID. The first step in the OSPF operation is to enable the local process on each router. When the process initializes, it must allocate a unique router ID to be able to send OSPF messages. Before the router can send messages and form adjacencies with other routers, we also have to specify which interfaces will participate in the OSPF process and which area they will belong to. We can use the global network area command, which includes interfaces matching the specified network range. This command includes the interfaces that fall within the specified range in the OSPF process, meaning the router starts sending OSPF hello packets to these interfaces. This is the wildcard mask, which is the inverse of the subnet mask. And it also includes which area the routers will belong to. OSPF implements the area concept. An area is a segment of the network where routers exchange routing information. It helps in scaling large networks by dividing them into smaller sections, reducing the amount of routing information each device must process and store. The area concepts has the following improvements. LSAs are only flooded into the area when we add a new link. The LSA update is only sent to the routers in Area 2. Each area also has its own Link State Database, or LSDB. Since LSAs are only flooded within an area, this makes the database smaller and doesn't require too much CPU and memory. And changes in one area do not affect the other areas, which improves the convergence time. The devices in Area 2 and 3 do not need to run the SPF algorithm when a new link is added in Area 2, which optimizes the CPU usage. There's different OSPF network architecture or design. These architectural choices affect factors like the size of the link state database, or LSDB, and the frequency of the SPF calculations. Let's start with a single area OSPF. This design is best for smaller networks where all routers can maintain consistent, full knowledge of the entire network topology. The main characteristic of this is that all routers are configured to be part of a single OSPF area, typically Area 0 or the backbone area. LSAs are flooded throughout the single area. The advantage of this design is that it's easier to configure and troubleshoot compared to a multi-area design. And every router has complete information, which can lead to optimal path selection without summarization needs. And for disadvantages, first is limited stability. A single topology change in one part of the network can affect all routers in the entire single area. And another one is scalability issues. In large networks, all routers must possess a large number of LSAs and maintain a complete LSDB leading to a high CPU and memory usage. Another OSPF design is multi-area OSPF. This is recommended for enterprise-level networks to segment the network into smaller, more manageable domains or areas. The advantage is the same as the single area OSPF, so for disadvantages, first would be the increased complexity. The design and configuration are more complex, requiring experienced network administrators. Going back to the global network area command, this is where you assign an area and it's area 0 in this example. After OSPF process ID is enabled and a router ID was chosen, Next step is to establish neighbor adjacencies. Once the routing process is enabled on a router, it starts sending hello messages on all OSPF-enabled links to determine whether neighbors are present on those segments. This is how we can see how the routers become two-way neighbors. In the beginning, both devices have an empty neighbor table because none of them have received hello packets. This is referred to as the down state. 
When R2 receives the hello packet from R1 but does not see its own router ID in the hello message, it transitions to the initialized state. In this state, R2 records R1's router ID in its neighbor table and starts including R1's router ID in the hello messages that it sends on this. When R1 receives the hello packet from R2 and sees its own router ID in the hello message, it transitions its neighbor state with R2 to the two-way state. This means that both routers recognize each other as neighbors. When two routers reach the two-way state, they start syncing their network information, or the LSDB. And instead of sending the entire database, which is usually very large, they first send each other a summary list of what they have. In this example, R2 checks and sees that it has 45 LSAs but missing 5. Then, R1 asks for those 5 missing LSAs using the link state request. R2 replies with the full details of those 5 LSAs in a link state update packet which can include multiple LSAs. After this exchange, both routers now have the same LSDB and move into the full state, meaning they see the network the same way. Then, next is step 3, which is exchange LSAs and build the topology table, or the LSDB. Once all routers in the network reach a full state, they start exchanging link state advertisements, or the LSAs. These LSAs are shared or flooded across the whole network so that every router has the same link state database. And all routers update their LSDB and recalculate the routes. This works smoothly in small to medium networks, but in large networks, OSPF can struggle because the LSDB can become huge and can require more RAM and it can also use up more bandwidth. And running SPF often uses a lot of CPU. In short, OSPF keeps all routers in sync by flooding LSAs, but this can get heavy in very large networks. After exchanging LSAs and building topology table, the next step is to execute the SPF algorithm. The link state database is like a map of the whole network. It shows all routers and all links, but it doesn't directly tell a router how to get to a destination. Each router runs the SPF algorithm, also called Dijkstra's algorithm, on the map. The SPF algorithm compares all possible paths and picks the best or shortest route from the router's own point of view. For example, this is the best path from R1 to network A. Because each router has a different starting location on the map. Once the SPF algorithm finishes, the router takes the best routes it found and installs them into its routing table for actual packet forwarding. Then comes the last step, which is updating the routing table with the best paths. In short, the LSDB gives routers the map, but the SPF algorithm figures out the fastest routes from each router's perspectives and puts those into the routing table. And to review how OSPF works, first is to enable the local routing process and choose the router ID. Next is establishing neighbor adjacencies. Then next is exchange LSAs and build the topology table or the LSDB. After that is execute the SPF algorithm. And last is update the routing table with the best paths. Let's now discuss implementing OSPF. A designated and backup designated router is needed to implement OSPF. And here are the reasons why we need designated routers in OSPF. On a shared LAN like Ethernet, if every router talks to every other router, it creates a lot of duplicate work. For example, if there's a new router joining, it would receive the same LSDB from all routers even though it's identical. And every router would form full adjacencies with every other router, causing excessive flooding of the same LSAs when something changes, 
This wastes bandwidth and processing power. To fix this, OSPF uses a designated router or DR and a backup designated router or BDR. The DR is the main point for LSDB exchanges and LSA flooding. Other routers only form full adjacencies with the DR and BDR instead of with everyone else. This keeps the network efficient, reduces duplicate traffic, and prevents unnecessary flooding. This is how DR and BDR work in OSPF. On a shared LAN, OSPF elects a designated router and a backup designated router to reduce unnecessary adjacencies and flooding. Let's break down how the DR and BDR election process works. The DR election process is based on a parameter in the OSPF Hello packet called Priority. By default, every router has Priority 1. A router with a higher priority value is eligible to be elected as the designated router on the VLAN segment. And a router with priority 0 is not eligible in the election process. If the priority are tied between all the routers, the highest router ID is chosen. And here are the key rules in the election process. There is no preemption in the DR-BDR process. Once a DR or BDR is chosen, it stays that way until it goes down. A new higher priority router joining later cannot take over. Another rule is BDR takes over if DR fails. When the DR fails, the BDR immediately becomes the DR. A new election then decides the next BDR. Routers that are neither DR nor BDR are called DR others. And they only stay in a two-way state with each other. Let's go through the LSA flooding process with DR. On shared LAN, OSPF uses the DR as a hub for flooding LSAs to avoid chaos. Non-DR BDR routers send their LSA updates to the designated routers. The DR updates all OSPF routers on the LAN. All routers listen to this router, so everyone gets the updated LSDB.